Series. Um, before we get started, just a couple of programmatic announcements. Um, first off, I'd like to encourage you not only to enjoy today's talk, but also to come to next week's talk, which will be by uh, Ron Greeley, and it'll be about Eolian features in the solar system. So it should be a really fascinating study of um, the surface geology of uh, various other worlds um, that have been formed by wind and wind-like processes. So for um, for this week, we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Van Cleve. I'd like to first remind you that these talks are taped. You can find them all on our website. Um, if you go to www.seti.org and click on the picture of uh, Frank Drake that says scientific lectures, you'll get to the archive page for the colloquium series. We um, put up e um, either the, the um, PowerPoint slides or a videoed version of the talk. Um, and those usually take about a week or two in processing to get online. So I encourage you, if you missed any talks in the series, or if you just want to take a look at the archive of talks that we have, to go to that page. We also have an email list. You can sign up for it, again, by going to that colloquium webpage um, so that you can get announcements of upcoming talks. So, and also, because these talks are recorded, we um, use this microphone here for questions so that your questions can also, be can also go into the record. People can hear you. Um, so I encourage you to hold your questions until the end of the talk um, when we'll have time for um, me to bring you the microphone. You can ask questions then that way um, rather than asking questions during the talk itself. So today's talk, again, is by Dr. Jeffrey Van Cleve. And he's apparently some kind of secret super spy because my usual Google techniques of digging up background on people were almost a complete and utter failure. So I'm going to have to ask Jeff to uh, give us two sentences about his background. And then he'll tell us today about the Kepler mission and the search for extrasolar planets. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to give this talk today. The reason she can't find me on Google is because computers have an endless amount of trouble with the space between the two, uh, two parts of my last name. So uh, it's a, that's at least the cover story for why I'm hard to find. So it's my pleasure to be able to talk to you today uh, about what I'm working on now, which is Kepler, and its relationship to the possibility of interstellar travel uh, in terms of where are the nearest Earth-like planets, and I'll talk about that later. And then an amusing speculation about why the Kepler mission is scheduled to end about the time the world is scheduled to end according to the Mayan calendar. So, and that, that will be the questionable part of the presentation. So, but I put it at the end as, as per her instructions. So, a little bit about me. I uh, worked on the Spitzer Space Telescope on the infrared spectrograph. I'm a co -I, and my area of scientific interest with Spitzer is the icy moons of the outer solar system and their infrared properties. Uh, my other scientific interest, of course, is extrasolar planets. And so it's my great privilege to never had to work on something that wasn't something I'd do anyway, but I didn't tell HR that, so they'd pay me to do it. So the first part of my talk is about Kepler, and it's about Kepler, the mission to detect Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars. Possibly a subject for another day is about Kepler, the magician and mathematician and, and astrologer, and his contemporaries, John Dee and uh, and Tycho Brahe, but that, that'll be another lecture. I'll just show you his picture today, quite a, quite a strange ranger as well as Tycho. We're, overview is why are we doing this? Um, we're looking for habitable planets. What's a habitable planet? How do you find planets? And so I'll give you a kind of top level introduction to this without going into gory detail about the technology or the, the fairly sophisticated data analysis methods we're going to have to use to pull out interesting phenomena from a large stack of data, which is, which is something that happens a lot here at SETI, but I, I won't be going into that today. And I'm sure most of you in this room are requiring no convincing that, that such a mission is, is interesting and important because uh, we are looking at these two terms of the Drake equation. And here at SETI, we have people like myself working on NASA grants, uh, looking at the probability of planets around Earth-like uh, sun-like stars. And then we have our private donors who fund the, uh, the, the search for the product of all these terms, which is a communicating extraterrestrial civilization. 
And so these two terms are what we're working on with, uh, with Kepler, and also uh, there's another space mission launched by the French called Corot, and I'll, I'll show you what they've been able to get done in this area so far. And it addresses what must be most three most interesting questions you can ask in science. How did we get here? Where are we going? Are we alone? And how did we get here? The planet formation probability, where are we going? How do planets evolve and die like Venus? And of course, are we alone? That kind of speaks for itself. What Kepler will do is look for transits of planets across their star. I like to talk, I, I like in, in more like talking to the Boy Scouts or, or, a, or a fifth grade class, I say we're looking for the shadows of habitable planets around other stars. That's what's great about this business. You can explain to children why it's interesting. And so we're going to be able to measure the orbital period by the amount of time that passes between transits and the size, that is the, the diameter or the relative cross-sectional area compared to its star by the depth of the transit in the light curve. And then the mass we can get from radial velocity measurements at least down to roughly Earth-sized Earth -sized masses. What does habitable mean to you? Here's a picture of me exploring the limits of the habitable zone in, uh, in Colorado. So it says right temperature, uh, kind of at the borders there since it's like this most of the year round. Uh, there's liquid water, well at least part of the time it's starting to freeze there. Air to breathe, well I'm at 10,000 feet so there's about 60% uh, about of the air to breathe at that altitude as down here at sea level. Light to keep you warm and to see, well it's a cloudy day so it's not as, not as bright as you'd like it to be. Less radiation shielding being up there at 10,000 feet. And uh, as far as asteroid protection goes, well, it's probably just as good as being down here. But uh, here I am uh, looking at all, all of these factors except the asteroids. And we want to look for these factors in worlds that we consider habitable. And what Kepler, Kepler will tell us is at the right temperature, at least in terms of its distance from the star, though a lot of other things go into planetary temperatures like the properties of their atmosphere liquid water is at the right temperature again, and then air to breathe comes up with the, the mass of the body or its size. The temperature is affected by the luminosity of the star, distance from the star of course, whether the planet's orbit is circular or elliptical, and whether there are greenhouse gases. And so, for example, Venus would have a lower radiative equilibrium temperature than the Earth because of the high albedo of its clouds, but because the greenhouse effect surface is hot enough to, uh, to melt lead. This chart here is based on a, a pioneering paper by Casting, Whitmire, and Reynolds in 93 about what constitutes a, a habitable zone. Their analysis was more sophisticated than simple radiative transfer because they included the properties of, of an atmosphere composed of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor in various concentrations. And they also accounted for the fact that stars tend to grow brighter with time as they evolve down the main sequence. So they defined a continuously habitable zone uh, as shown by this green strip here. And we see our solar system, there's Venus, which is putatively in the continuously habitable zone, but uh, uh, because of its dense carbon dioxide atmosphere, it's, it's just at the limit there and Mars, which is just outside. And we show the orbital period of a planet as a function of semi-major axis and spectral type. This is uh, kind of dense with information, so I won't, won't go through it in further detail. But this is one way of defining what are we looking for on this chart. And I'll, I'll give you a, a somewhat simpler way of doing that in a subsequent chart. Of course, planet size affects habitability. If it's too large, it turns into a gas giant. Can't live there, as far as we know. If it's too small, it has no atmosphere. And uh, there's debate about whether that's a tenth of an Earth mass, which is the mass of Mars, uh, or half an Earth mass. Um, you know, recent news, news bite was that they'd found like burps of methane on Mars. And so you know, maybe that's at the, the limits of the habitable zone for that mass. So I put it in there as that. Again, the same chart, 
but just adding a little more definition to how we guide the search, what kinds of stars, the habitable zone, and a planet sizes, which is another dimension it's, uh, to this phase space here. So how do we detect extrasolar planets? Well, there's uh, a variety of methods. Uh, the first one to produce results was pulsar timing. Uh, a guy at uh, Cornell, Wolkshen, uh, found very, very small changes in the, the period of pulsar radiation. But since you can measure frequencies to very high precision, that was enough to detect Earth mass or even lunar mass planets around a pulsar. Now that kind of fails the test of being habitable, uh, but it was, the, it was the first evidence of planet mass bodies around other stars. Meat and potatoes of current work is radial velocity, where you look at the reflex motion of a planet going around its star. The star pulls on the planet, but the planet also pulls on the star and causes it to move towards or away from you in radial velocity. And the, there are over 200 planets detected by, by radial velocity means and the mass limit is, is, called, is super Earth. And super Earth is a, a, a term that describes planets that are more massive than the Earth, but not big enough to have turned into gas giants, like one to 10 Earth masses. And so kind of, kind of like stretching this a bit, you could say maybe 10 Earth mass planets could be discovered by radial velocity. Uh, a basic limit is set not by signal and noise, but by astrophysics. There are other astrophysical phenomena like star spots that add systematic errors to your radial velocity measurement. Jack? We're close to the planet. There are already 20 Earth planets in less than 5 Earth masses. Okay, so then super Earth, super Earth is down to like 3 or what would, you, what would, be, what would, be, a, what would be the detection limit? On well, Right. If you're talking about an M star, the habitable zone is at, you know, it might be able to detect two, three Earth mass, especially if you're really interested in the star, and which really could be super Earth in the way that 10 Earth mass bodies probably are. Okay. So this is, uh, and this illustrates my point about how these other techniques are crowding into what we're interested in with Kepler, Earth mass planets in the habitable zone. And so there's, there's various permutations of planets which contain not all of those attributes, either they're Earth mass, but they're really close in, or they're, uh, they're, not in, the, or they're, they're in the habitable zone, but they're massive. And I'll, I'll show you a plot that shows you where everyone else is on this chart. Astrometry is where you look at the stars move back and forth in the plane of the sky. This is in development, but it hasn't, at least in terms of looking at the, the exoplanet encyclopedia and their, their current list of detected planets, astrometry is not responsible for a significant number of extrasolar planet detections in the absence of other techniques. What we're going to do with Kepler is transit photometry. Again, this is a, a cartoonish light curve. The planet passes in front of the star. The light dips a little bit. And this, the size of this dip is like one part in 10,000. So we have to build a very stable, very precise camera and have sophisticated data analysis methods to remove systematic effects. Reflection photometry from space, uh, we'll be able to do that with Kepler, not for Earth-sized planets, but for sub-Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus-sized planets. And then an interesting technique is microlensing. And you can detect objects, two, three Earth masses. The problem with this is that you don't have detailed knowledge of the stellar system that the object's in, such as its semi-major axis, or what, what magnitude, what kind of star it's orbiting. So you're kind of forced into making statistical assertions about the known distribution of stars by spectral type. But still in all, you, you can get, get some very interesting results that are not, not available by other means. And direct imaging from space, this is, this is uh, under study. And it says source J. Lissauer. So Jack could possibly talk to that at 
some other point, but uh, there are some direct imaging results from the ground that were just published in Science Magazine a couple of weeks ago, and I'll, I'll show you those on a subsequent chart. This uh, chart here is where I like to call the Kepler Corral, which is where we're looking for Earth-like planets, habitable zone. And, and what I've done is I've taken the data from the exoplanet encyclopedia and calculated a radiative equilibrium temperature neglecting greenhouse effect. And if you apply this calculation, you get the Earth is 300 Kelvin in some, some average sense. So that's, that's a little high, but uh, given the, the forgiving nature of the scales here, it uh, it's conveys the point about how far current detections are from the Kepler corral here. And we see a variety of <laughs> detection methods. The, these diamonds here are radial velocity or astrometry the, as they're listed in the catalog, though I don't think any of these are first detections by astrometry. Uh, the uh, yellow boxes have both radial velocity and transit data uh, on them from either the ground or the EPOC program, which is an extended mission of the Deep Impact spacecraft, using its 30 centimeter telescope to do um, Neptune and, and on up size uh, transit photometry at about the one part per thousand level. And these little X's overlaid on the transit measurements are from the Kuro space mission, which I mentioned earlier. Its, uh, its goals and uh, instrumentation are similar to that of Kepler, except it's in, a, in an orbit that's not as conducive to watching planetary systems for years at a time. And also it's a smaller aperture, and so they have, their, uh, they have a possibility of discovering planets down in this, this mass range here. But in terms of what they've actually been able to publish over the last couple of years, there's just these, these crosses there. And then here are the direct imaging results. And the most recent ones were FOMOHOUT and HR 8799, which were published in Science Magazine just like, like a couple of months ago. Uh, really, really impressive work with, uh, with Hubble Space Telescope. Down here in the green triangles, we see uh, the microlensing results. You see that you get big ones, but you can also get rather, rather small planets in terms of Earth masses. And, uh, and the most lowest mass detection is, is this object here, which I'll talk in more detail in the next slide. But that may be only as massive as 1.4 Earth masses. So we're, we're getting into very close to well, the center of the Kepler corral is just that, that these tend to be a little further away, uh, at least statistically speaking, than the habitable zone. Just as the direct imaging, of course, it works better when the planet's far from its star and when it's giving off its own infrared radiation because it's like really big and still cooling off from its formation. So you see objects out here that are quite massive in terms of Earth masses. Uh, just for reference, Jupiter is about 300 Earth masses right about here. And they're all like really big and really cold because that, that's what makes for tractable visual imaging, at least with ground-based uh, or existing space-based technology. So here's a, a close-up of the habitable zone uh, area. And so here's the, the Ogol and MOA detections. These are groups of astronomers that have microlensing experiments. They just watch. Yes? Yes. They're actually very hot. That's what we're seeing. Yes, yes. We're, it, they are hot. They are well outside the habitable zone, but right now they're hot because they're still cooling from formation, and that's, that's how they're able to do those detections down here. And so uh, you know, there might be a temporarily habitable zone actually orbiting these objects, but that's, that's a story for another day. So here are the, uh, this is just a close up. It's the same data set, just so you can see that the closest uh, detections are for, uh, for radial velocity and microlensing. And uh, has, it, has it actually been done, Jack, that somebody's found a three Earth mass object by radial velocity, or it's, it's theoretically possible to do so?
Oh, okay. Yeah. See, there's there's uh, some of those guys like right there. That's like a five uh, mass, and and then up here, yeah. Here we go. This is like a five five Earth mass, and the, you know, the calculated radiative temperature. It's hot, but it is it is Earth Earth size. So you you see that no one's put a, a dot in the box, as I, I kind of point out in my my title up here. But uh, they're they're approaching it closely, and it'd be interesting to see as time goes by how close. Uh, they can come to this box. Now, what, what Kepler's going to do is fill this box with points. So we'll actually be able to do statistical studies of what's the probability that a planet of a given spectral type has an Earth-like planet. Uh, though uh, certainly in terms of public recognition, whoever puts the first point in that box <coughs> will, will have a lot to talk about as well. So that, that motivates us to, to kind of keep Kepler on its launch schedule, to the idea that someone else might put one box. One, I mean, the first discovery in this box will attract about as much popular attention as the next 50, so it'd be kind of nice for us to be able to do that. So in order to fill that box, we're going to take a different approach, transits, uh, as I mentioned. And uh, we have to do this outside the Earth's atmosphere, because the, uh, the practical limit, as far as I can tell from the literature, even at the best sites on the surface of the Earth, is about one part in a thousand uh, one sigma uh, photometry. And we need to do uh, uh, 20 part per million one sigma photometry to find Earth. So you can, you can find these guys from the ground, but from these, the, the atmosphere of the Earth sets a limit that you have to go beyond. <coughs> and so the method is, uh, is robust, but you have to be patient and you have to take a, a shotgun approach. You don't know ahead of time where these transits are, otherwise you wouldn't be doing the missions. So uh, you have to look at a lot of stars and then just count on a small fraction of them having uh, planets that pass right between the star and you. And that probability uh, varies with how close the planet is to the star and the size of the star. Uh, but for Earth around the sun, uh, this is a roughly one half of 1% chance for a random ensemble of orientations of a solar system that a planet will pass in front of the star. And it's more or less independent of planet mass, except when the planet size is large enough to give an appreciable probability of grazing transits of one kind or another. Now, to publish this, you really need to see at least three transits, because if you just see one little bump in the course of uh, uh, a year or so, it doesn't really mean much, given the other possible explanations. You see two, that doesn't mean a lot either, but if you see three, then you've got two intervals, which if they're exactly the same length is, is very compelling that you're observing a, a planetary body orbiting. Uh, interesting interesting uh, sidebar to this is that it's easier to detect planets of a given size for a star of a given apparent magnitude for late type stars like M dwarfs. The star is smaller, so for a given size planet, the relative transit depth <coughs> is larger. And so it's easier to see a transit and demonstrate that it is a transit against a background of not only shot noise, but also systematic effects. The habitable zone is close to the star, so the period is shorter and you can see more transits in a given amount of observing time. So when you fold the time series, by various periods so that only periodic phenomena show up, then the folded time series will show a transit event with a higher signal of noise because there's more transit in a given photometric time series of a given length. And then if you've got many detections of equally spaced intervals between events, that's, that's very compelling that it's a planet rather than some other cause. This assumes that the probability of Earth-sized planet formation is constant as a function of spectral type. The great thing about Kepler is we'll be able to test that hypothesis. And uh, I know Jack's published some papers on this subject, but I, I, the conclusion was that they might be a little rarer for M dwarfs. Or So that's, that's another, another layer to this onion. But uh, like I said, the great thing is that we can test this hypothesis. We can't test the dryness of these, these 
planets, as, as Jack pointed out, but uh, we can test whether they exist and have the right cross-sectional area. Uh, this, is, this is kind of an eye chart, but I just wanted to talk to a, a couple of values here. Uh, looking at our, s our Earth around our Sun as a reference, the probability of a transit of a planet that exists in the habitable zone is like half a percent. If you go to an M5 dwarf, it's 2.6 percent, a factor of five increase. And if you look at the relative transit depth, uh, which uh, is 84 parts per million, for uh, the Earth orbiting the Sun, you find it can be almost 14 times deeper, relatively speaking, for an M5 dwarf. Now, the catch in all this is that I made the statement that for a given apparent magnitude, it gets a lot easier to find planets around late-type dwarfs. They are, of course, fainter, and so having a sample of a large number of M-type dwarfs of a given magnitude is difficult unless you survey the whole sky, which is the idea behind the TESS mission, a possible follow-on to Kepler, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few slides. The Kepler mission concept, on the other hand, is to stare at a fixed patch of sky of roughly 100 square degrees in Cygnus and to do photometric precision of 20 parts per million in six and a half hours so that an Earth-sized transit can be detected at a, a signal and noise of four. It's in a heliocentric orbit trailing the Earth so that it can stare continuously in one direction without having to maneuver because of its orbit around the Earth. And the nominal mission is three and a half years and uh, there are enough consumables like uh, gas for controlling the attitude of the spacecraft uh, to last another two and a half or three years. So uh, that not only would give us the possibility of finding five one-year period events, um, make a more compelling case for that, but also habitable planets around stars slightly earlier in spectral type than the Earth around the Sun because they'll have longer periods. Now, an interesting question for those of us doing, doing the data analysis on Kepler is if we see a periodicity of one year in the data, it almost certainly has to do with the period of Kepler going around the sun rather than a planet around another star that just has to, happens to be a one-year period. So I anticipate a lot of interesting and subtle discussions on that subject. But uh, once, you, once you get substantially away from one year, then you don't have to worry about those kind of pathological artifacts because it's, you're synchronized with the Earth's orbit around the Sun. The expected results are that uh, we would detect about 50 planets if most of them have um, th are the size of the Earth. If they're super-Earths, then it, it goes up very rapidly, the number of planets we could hope to detect. Uh, objects like this might be about 10 times the mass of the Earth, so they might be accreting an envelope. It's not clear that something this size is stable, and it probably depend a lot on the details of the nebula in which it forms. And then we might discover about 70 cases of two or more planets persistence per, per system. And then of these 50 or 200 or whatever number of planets, we'll have thousands of transit events uh, in order to demonstrate that the phenomenon is periodic and most likely a planet around the other star. And we'll get additional results about the planetary systems uh, that contain these Earth-like planets by looking at the reflected light of giant inner planets. I mean, from what we're discovering now, not everything looks like the Earth's solar system. You could have super-Earths that are hot, I mean, super, like Jupiter's, of Jupiter-sized planets that are hot and close into their sun, and then possibly Earth-sized planets further out. And then in other systems, we'll just see those hot Jupiters and not the uh, Earth-sized planets, but there's interesting astrophysics in this, too. And, of course, lots of, lots of transits of giant planets and a, a mixture of these. So uh, this is to show that we have gone way beyond uh, the concept stage. This is our focal plane uh, being assembled at Ball Aerospace. And it contains uh, 96 million pixels, uh, each of which is four arc seconds on the sky. It's a lot of pixels, and we don't downlink all of them. We only send down the pixels that contain stars of interest. And so we wind up sending down only about six million pixels, uh, uh, and they're collected every half hour. There's no reason to 
um, send down pixels that don't have anything in them. So that's how we're able to look at all these stars without overloading our downlink and uh, data storage abilities. This is the completed flight system at Ball under construction, showing various components like the there's the focal plane again, the primary mirror, the Schmidt corrector. It's a very wide field of view camera and various other aspects like the spacecraft itself that controls the attitude and provides power. And this is now down at the Cape. We are scheduled for a March, uh, March 5th launch at around uh, 1030 at night. And so this has moved far beyond uh, PowerPoint presentations and uh, we're, we're counting down 43 days from today. So unique features to summarize in terms of the, the hardware and the mission concept is we're collecting 170,000 stars worth of data. Uh, the precision of the instrument is 10 parts per million. And I said we're doing 20 part per million photometry. The difference between the 10 and the 20 is the shot noise from the source and noise due to the intrinsic astrophysical variability of the parent star. It's one of the largest Schmidt telescopes built. I would mo that's probably the largest Schmidt telescope built that we know about in space. And it's a very large <laughs> field of view, 100 square degrees for this size aperture. Uh, again, there's, I'm sure there's something looking down that's bigger, but I don't, I don't know about it. <laughs> so excitement is building, as, as is fear, as we understand how much data we're going to have to analyze and the, the subtlety of the processing that will have to be done and the, the destruction of our scientific <laughs> careers if we publish a false positive in this area. So I, definitely excitement is building of one kind or another. Uh, the flight hardware is at the Cape, two months until data starts flowing. I mean, it launches March 5th. There's a bit of tumbling and attitude adjustment and run around in circles for a couple of weeks. And then two months, we're going to start getting science data down. And uh, this is uh, even, even in the, the headquarters, this is judged to be great science. Uh, so uh, uh, interestingly enough, when the president's vision for space exploration came out, Kepler was one of the the few uh, unmanned missions that were part of that, uh, I, I guess as it speaks to the beyond part of Moon, Mars, and beyond. So we're fortunate in that sense. Science team uh, has been working for many years to make this come to pass. And I won't read off their names individually, but there's a lot of talent and the world's uh, best folks in this area of science. And so looking forward to a lot of interesting results, uh, including our collaborators from Denmark who are studying very intensely the, the parent stars of these putative planetary systems through a technique called astroseismology. And so since what we measure in uh, transit is the ratio of the planet size to the star size, precise measurement of the star size through astroseismology is a, is a really important part of, of getting the science right here. And uh, let's not our forget our good buddies on the management team here. Jim Fanson at <laughs> JPL, among other people he works with, and Alan Frobeter, and now uh, John Trelsch at Ball Aerospace. So in summary, we're going to observe more than 100,000 dwarf stars for three and a half to six plus years with the precision of detecting Earth-sized planets in the <coughs> habitable zone. Uh, we can detect planets from the size of Mars, probably mostly around red dwarfs because they're small too, and orbital periods from days up to two years so that if we get like the six-year extended mission, we'll be able to publish results on things with two-year periods. And uh, here's a rough, rough guess of the number of planets. We don't we don't know for squat, really, what these numbers are. That's why we're doing the experiment. But we're also doing the experiment on such a scale that a null result would be very significant. And that's, that's really important. We don't you know, want to have just one, you know, four square degrees instead of 100. Don't see anything. Well, what's the power of that result? Uh, if uh, this works according to plan, uh, it'll be a null result, which will be both, uh, both depressing and very significant, at least for some of us. And so we expect to have results in the sense of candidate transits about six months after the end of commissioning, because in six months you can detect three events of two months apiece, and that gets you down into like M0 stars. And so there's a, enough of those in our observing list that there's a, a good probability if planets are at least 30% likely 
that we'll have something to publish at the AAS meeting in January of 2010. So okay, sign us up to that. Mm, there we go. So now, now, uh, now I move beyond the material prepared by Dave Koch with a few uh, additions from myself to the, the second and third parts of my talk. And it occurred to me it would be interesting to calculate what is the nearest transiting uh, extra solar Earth that uh, we might find. And that's, that's interesting for a number of reasons, all of them having to do with detection follow-up. If it's close, you have a better chance of resolving it with direct imaging. If it's close, you have a better chance of seeing the reflex motion of the star in the plane of the sky, which is astrometry. And, occur and you, you'll see it, you know, the star will move back and forth, not in a circle, because you're seeing a transit. Uh, it's good for radial velocity, so you can measure the mass, because a, a late-type dwarf, which is intrinsically faint, if it's close, then you'll have enough photons to do part per million uh, radial velocity spectra. And then uh, the ultimate form of follow-up was suggested by George Ricker, the PI of TESS, who said, in fact, when starships transporting colonists first depart the solar system, they may well be headed toward a TESS-discovered planet as their new home. So uh, to me, that's like the final form of, of follow-up. So uh, having <laughs> the dirt samples, right? And so, so this, I, I read this and, and uh, was amused by it. And so I thought I'd actually do a calculation of how far away the nearest transiting planet would be under certain uh, assumptions about the probability of planets around a star of a given spectral type. Now, Kepler's not likely to find a particularly close uh, star to the Earth because Kepler's like a narrow beam searchlight. This is a, a representation of Kepler's search space, which is a cone of light uh, going out to, uh, in the direction of Cygnus to one of the arms of the galaxy where there's lots of, lots of stars. And if you assume that stars are uniformly distributed in that cone and then take the number of stars likely to have planets detected by Kepler and say, well, what, f what number of stars are within 60 light years of that 100 to 1,000 stars? And you find that there's less than a 2% chance that by dumb luck, Kepler will score uh, a transiting Earth-sized planet within 60 light years. So what Kepler will give us is not the nearest Earth-like planet, but the inputs to calculating how close the nearest Earth-like planet is, because we will measure the probability of planets as a function of spectral type from a representative sample out here, and then we'll be able to calculate if we assume, as we must, that the properties of the galaxy are, are similar in one place to another, uh, how close the nearest Earth-like planet will be. Now, detecting that with uh, with a transit method is uh, something that uh, the uh, device called TESS might be able to do. Uh, it's an all-sky follow-on mission at Kepler, which takes the complementary approach of instead of shining a, a beam into the deeps, it, uh, it looks for the nearest like red dwarfs and looks for transits around them. And so they have a, a clever design where they have multiple telescopes so that the field of view of the ensemble of telescopes is 2,000 square degrees. So it covers 20 times as much area on the sky as Kepler. Uh, the, uh, the downside of that is its, its aperture is only five inches in diameter, or 12.7 centimeters, uh, which is only about an eighth of the, the aperture of Kepler. So it, it can only see stars that are like 10th magnitude or 9th magnitude instead of 12th for these transits. But it's complementary and of comparable power if you, uh, if you look at what's called the A omega product, which is the product of telescope area and angular area of sky searched. Now, if you want to hypothesize a system that would find all of the, the uh, Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone within 60 light years, you, I kind of brainstormed an idea called Kepler tests on steroids or multiple Keplers. And so what that means is that the, the calculation I'm going to do and this, this conjured observatory are limited only by the completeness of the Hipparchos catalog out to, out to 20 parsecs. In other words, uh, uh, a red dwarf of M5 spectral type would be observable 
uh, by, by a, this blown up version of TESS. And so when you do the math about what's the brightness of the stars and their spectral type in the Hipparchos catalog and, and it, the precision is set by spectral type because red dwarfs give a bigger relative signal, uh, you get an aperture of roughly 50 centimeters in diameter, which is four times as big as each of the telescopes here, but not, not outside the realm of, of plausibility given enough money and time. Uh, it's not uh, like it violates some law of physics to do this. So you'd need to dwell on the sky for six months in each 2,000 square degree or 3,000 square degree patch to capture the transits of M, M naught uh, dwarfs. And seven such telescopes can survey the full sky in seven years. So now having invented a, a system that doesn't exist just to justify my very simple calculation, I will now move on to the very simple calculation. The way I did this was to download the Hipparchos catalog for parallaxes greater than 50 milli arc seconds, look up the geometrical probability of a transit for that kind of spectral type, which I showed you in that, that eye chart table earlier, multiply by probability that a star will have a planet in the habitable zone, which I take as being constant for all spectral types in this approximation, and I ignore multiplicity. Uh, both, uh, both of which can be improved with data from, from Kepler. Having done that, I sort the results by increasing distance from the sun and then calculate the cumulative probability that a transiting planet will be found within a, a distance d of the sun. And here are my results. The black curve shows uh, the probability that there is at least one transiting planet in the habitable zone uh, within this distance. So if every star, like our sun, uh, has at least one uh, planet, like the Earth, in the habitable zone, there's a 50% chance that the nearest transiting Earth-like planet is 20 light years away. If you take a more middle-of-the-road assertion that roughly 30% of sun-like stars have an Earth-like planet, which is comparable to the number of stars which have detected Jupiters from radial velocity, then you've got a 50% confidence level that the nearest transiting system is uh, 35 light years away. And then if you go to higher levels of confidence, of course, you, you have to assume it's further out. And so that, uh, that imaginary destination for those test colonists might be about 35 light years uh, distance, which uh, is, would take a mere 300 to 500 years to travel with a, a Helium-3 deuterium fusion rocket, so it's not entirely out of the question. Yes? Because you're, you have almost a factor of two, so a little, over 20, a little under 20 to you know, a little more than twice that number of points. Yeah. And that means you have eight times the volume, so maybe seven times, but seven times 30% is 210%. So what gives? Uh, because it, it, when you, you look at the combinatorics, it's not, not precisely linear in this range. See, this is, this is already starting to fold over uh, from its, its linear range at small distances. And uh, this is not. This is still in its linear range. And so I, it, off the top of my head, that would well, that's be. That's why the curves turn over. I understand yeah. that. But why the curves aren't self-similar for the same number of stars in the same volume? Oh, you, you Yes, I mean, I, I, that's, that's, uh, that was my, my input was the Hipparchos catalog, so there may be some, okay, so some corruption to... the Hipparchos catalog, not the small stars. Right, I, I didn't go to the next step and try to extrapolate from a completeness radius to the edge of my search radius, so that's, I kind of did the, the simplest conceivable calculation and used the Hipparchos catalog. I don't know offhand how complete it is as a function of spectral type out to this range, but that's, that's certainly a missing piece of information. So now I get to my, my final part. It's the end of days and the end of my talk. Uh, this is the observatory at Chichen Itza and uh, down in, uh, in Guatemala. And it's uh, kind of worse for the wear, but I think it's a good uh, representation of uh, the end of days as predicted by astronomical means, at least by, by the Mayans. Mayan calendar is a, a 
very interesting set of interlock an interlocking series of calendars. It's one of those uh, those subjects that is so complex and interesting. It's provided uh, countless amount of activity to academics of one kind or another over over the years. There are two uh, two calendars, uh, one of which is roughly a, a year, and the other is 260 days for for reasons that or speculated on widely, which resynchronize every 52 years about a human lifetime uh, in those days, un unless you're a sacrificer or something like that. <laughs> kind of big, big outliers there. Now, for longer periods of time, they had a system of historical reckoning called the long count, which was a five-digit system with mixed bases with, with these values. You multiply those together, you get 5,125 tropical years. And in Mayan creation accounts, the present world and the humans in it were preceded by other worlds, up to five others, which were fashioned in various forms by the gods, but subsequently destroyed. Now, it turns out, interestingly enough, that five cycles is within seven-tenths of a percent of the measured uh, processional cycle of the Earth's axis. And I. I I think it's a kind of interesting that, that, that this may be more than a coincidence, even though um, the degree to which the Mayans knew about procession, which Hipparchos among the Greeks first, first talked about, uh, is still unclear. It just, it just seems like a remarkable coincidence that five of these periods is, is like really close to a processional cycle. And then there are various speculations about what happens, happens next. If the past is any guide to the future, then uh, you have to look at the subsequently destroyed part of this, uh, <laughs> this, this statement here. And so that maybe brings us to a solution of the Fermi paradox. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's a story for another day as well. Uh, the origin of the calendar, of course, uh, is dated from astronomical events, and the scholars Goodman, Martinez, and Thompson are the widely separated, widely accepted registration of these events to the Gregorian calendar, and it's the GMT origin that gives the end of the world on December 21st, 2012, which those of you familiar with the New Age literature might have, might have heard about uh, before. And so this is an example of a, a calendar date uh, in, the, in the long count. The first five uh, of these seven have to do with these five bases here, and the other two have to do with the Hob and Tolkien uh, counts. And so I said a, an endless playpen for academics, uh, deciphering this stuff and figuring out, well, how do they, they know all this stuff? I mean, they didn't have telescopes. I mean, they just kind of looked at the sky and maybe did some you know, sighting along celestial objects over hundreds of uh, celestial objects along landmarks, but uh, I think it's pretty amazing. So in this, in this uh, calendar system, here's the remaining Kepler schedule of results. Uh, today is 12-19-16-0-10, uh, Our launch date uh, is here on March 5th. We expect the end of commissioning to be roughly two months after launch. It's scheduled for 45 days, but I've been on other flight programs, so I'm putting down two months here for commissioning. And then here's our six months of getting data before we can detect results in, in the sense that a result is a believable transit. And then the end of the nominal 3.5 year mission is 11 4 uh, 2012, which is 12, 19, 19, 15, 13. We're starting to run out the registers here. And so there's 46 days between the end of the nominal Kepler mission and the last day of the long count. And then the following day, the odometer clicks over to 13, <laughs> which is actually zero in the next cycle of the age. And if, if uh, George Ricker's plan go according to schedule, that might be the launch date of tests. So that would make a real, real interesting bookend between the end of one age and the other. As Kepler ends, uh, the cycle ends, the Earth is destroyed, and somehow TESS is not destroyed, and then it's launched the following day. <laughs> There's a handy Mayan calendar at this website if you're, you're interested in this kind of stuff. And then so finally, I took it upon myself to understand why there's a 46-day gap between the end of the Kepler mission and the last day of the long count. And so theories include a predestined but currently unknown launch or commissioning delay totaling 46 days, <laughs> or that the 46 days are required for the good people of Boulder and Sedona to teleport a substantial fraction of humanity to the uh, new worlds that Kepler will have discovered. 
So thank you for your attention. I hope you have found this both informative and amusing. We'll be happy to take your questions.